Hey everybody, on today's episode of Still To Be Determined, we're gonna be talking about hemp, how it's being used, and now that it's being used, we're gonna talk about some of the changes to the laws that allowed it to be reintroduced to American consumers. And will we start living with it? And will we start living in it? And of course, our regular listeners will recognize the sound of my voice. This is Sean Farrell. I am <laughs> a writer and I'm the older brother to Matt Farrell, who is, of course, the host and originator of Undecided with Matt Farrell, which is why we're here talking today. Matt, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? We're doing digging okay. out from a foot. Of, we're digging out from a foot of snow, but we're good. Here in the New York City area, we did not have snow. We had some freezing rain, and now we've got clear skies, and it's chilly, but it's a lovely day, and hoping that our listeners are experiencing the same. And of course, before we get started, I just wanted to send out a quick word of support. Not that I anticipate anybody is actually listening in Ukraine, but a quick word of support to the people of Ukraine who are undergoing nightmare scenario there. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are with you as are the thoughts of, I'm sure, the vast majority of our listeners. I can't imagine anybody looking at what's going on in the news right now and thinking, well, this is good. Yeah. So we hope people are able to get through it safely, and we're hoping for saner days ahead. As for today's episode, we're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode on his channel undecided with matt farrell this is the episode from february 22nd 2022 so in other words this is from two 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 yes i can only hope that matt dropped it at 2 22 p.m i wish i had i won't go back and double check that but and it's on this, a tuesday it is on a tuesday <laughs> so here we are talking about exploring how this plant could replace concrete and what we're talking about is the introduction of hemp as a building material. So we'll be talking about some of the details around hemp was gone for a long time and then it was brought back. And now that it's been brought back, it's being reintroduced in ways that people probably never expected. And Matt, I know that your research into this, one of the things that you make clear in your video is that you, you look back at the legality of, mm -hmm. of hemp as a material. It, of course, is a plant that is very closely related to marijuana. So it's yes. part of the cannabis family, I believe, is the family that it's a part of. Yes. And it got lumped in with cannabis. And depending on where you go searching, you'll find all sorts of conspiracy theories about why it got tied up yes. with, with marijuana. There is, of course, the very direct argument of it got lumped in with marijuana simply because it was related to marijuana. And there was concern about it being available as a drug despite the fact that you would have to smoke or ingest a garbage trucks worth of <laughs> hemp to get anywhere near the effect that you can get from one one hit of marijuana but there are theories that are bound around it's being lumped in and i'm wondering matt did you give any did you look yes. at any of those other theories and how much credence do you give those theories? Do you want to talk about some of those theories that you ran across? I don't give much credence to the, the conspiracy theories about why, but hemp, I mean, technically it wasn't illegal. Marijuana was what was illegal, but hemp was so tightly associated to it that it became burdensome for people to even bother farming trying it, and it trying to use it because yeah. it was just like there were all these like loopholes and legalities around it and issues and it was just like ah, it's not worth it to stay away from it so it wasn't that it was necessarily illegal it was just it became cost prohibitive it was too much of a pain so people just walked away from it so it's it, it's sad that that happened but it was there wasn't some giant conspiracy to suppress hemp like there was nothing nefarious against it from what i found there were plenty of conspiracy theories but nothing that i i found that was like solid like oh yeah that's exactly what it was Right. One of the theories I know I've I've heard of, I believe it might have been DuPont. The DuPont family was involved mm -hmm. in getting it <laughs> declared illegal because they had developed, if I remember correctly, the argument went they had developed a synthetic fiber mm -hmm. that they wanted to introduce into rope. But hemp rope was the leading rope manufacturing method. 
Mm -hmm. So in order to introduce the synthetic material into the market, the DuPonts got it to be cleared. They got hemp put on the no fly list. And then the synthetic fibers were able to take hold as the leading ingredient in rope. Yeah. Seems like a long way to go to get your item to market. We, of course, live in a world where we do see restrictions that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. Various products and various ingredients. I don't know that I buy into the idea that uh, the DuPont family actually was pulling those levers. I'm more of a believer of, was it it's Occam's razor or was it Hanlon's razor? I think the other one, which is like don't attribute to malice but you can attribute to stupidity it's like it's just there's (laughs) it's like people pass laws that are just like okay good intentions but they don't think about the side effects and the ramifications it has beyond what you were trying to solve and you create all these other problems it's like that's kind of what i saw from the research that we put together for this video was right it was just a lot of stupidity and people you know marijuana is the devil's drug and all this stuff get caught up in in stupid insanity around it yet we're drinking ourselves to oblivion yeah (laughs) but that's that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it certainly got lumped in with, and there was, there was also a large aspect of what you just pointed out, the entire argument of marijuana being a no-go and mm-hmm. alcohol being perfectly okay. It cuts across economic levels and it cuts across race. There mm-hmm. are all sorts of reasons why one was viewed as forbidden and one was viewed as socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And all of that ended up with, sadly, something that is environmental. It's a clearly sustainable good. And it, unfortunately, by staying off the market for as long as it did, has led to a dependence on all of these other products that are not nearly as environmentally friendly or renewable, as easily renewable as literally growing a fiber, just straight up out of the ground. So I thought it was fascinating that in the comments on this video, tons of people with direct growing experience weighed (laughs) in and I couldn't help but wonder, I'd like to share some of the comments, but as we talk about them, I'd be interested in your thoughts around, will you revisit this and possibly reach out to some of these people about their experiences? Because it seems like you simply stood up and said, hey, I want to talk about this thing called hemp. And suddenly all these first sources suddenly showed up at your door and were like, yeah, let me tell you about it. Yeah. So I'd like to start off with this one from Tony DeVera, who shared this anecdote. I grew the first hemp fiber trials in California in 2021. We grew 26 foot tall plants and yielded eight tons an acre in dry stock biomass. The plant and its potential is insane. My partners on the project have converted a cotton gin to process the hemp. The process to watch is adding hemp and lime to spray in insulation machines. It's a complete game changer. So I thought that that was very interesting. The idea of one of the things you talk about in your video is that the hemp blocks that you talk about, which are effectively, I mean, it's their Lego blocks. The hemp blocks, you talk about how they do such a good job of absorbing and then releasing moisture in safe ways where other building materials don't do that. Right. Would you, I imagine in a spray on insulation, you get some of that same benefit. Yes. It, it breathes yeah. essentially. It's, it's breathing and it adjusts with the moisture where concrete is very porous and absorbs moisture, but it ends up cracking and f- kind of crumbling away over time. Mm-hmm. hemp doesn't do that hemp just stays what it is so it, it can breathe and absorb and release that moisture back and forth again and again and again so it can expand a little bit and contract without cracking mm-hmm. so it's got a durability to it that doesn't exist in concrete it's it's fascinating right. and, and on that comment i don't know if you saw but he also posted a link to a video he put out i don't know if you watched it, it it's fascinating of him walking through what he called his hemp forest mm-hmm. and it was just this densely packed just like like if, imagine you're like this tall walking through your your lawn. It's like right. it was just these huge stalks of like what look like grass and just craziness. And it's this amazing material that can be harvested to do this stuff. Right. Yeah. You you also talked about it withstanding like an earthquake situations. It doesn't it yes. doesn't respond to shearing in quite the same way as right. as things like concrete. And I imagine that that is tied hand in hand to its breathability, its ability to take on the moisture, release the moisture, its ability to 
withstand those shearing forces Mm -hmm. speak to a resiliency that explains why you put in a new sidewalk in front of your, your home. And then the first winter you see cracks develop and all of that nice brand new sidewalk looks like it's been there for 20 years simply because moisture getting into that hairline fissure turns it into two slabs instead of one as a result of not being able to withstand shearing. I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it was a roughly three times better at withstanding shearing forces than concrete. So it's not earthquake proof, but it is really reliable in that kind of situation. It's not as good as, you know, for the compressive force, like for holding weight, but for that shearing force, it's really, really superior. There was also this from another grower, Frederick Larson, who wrote, I grew the first hemp in modern times here in north in the north of Sweden back in 2003. I had to wait to sow it until a midsummer's day because a court had to make a decision. I thought that's <laughs> fascinating. He grows it and then is standing there waiting for for a court to decide whether or not it's it's legal. And again, going back to the idea of this being a drug, it is being used as a source for CBD oil, which is yep. used to relieve anxiety and depression and it's basically a homeopathic approach to it. And I say that as somebody who has consumed CBD oil myself, I do find benefits from it depending on the mood. If I was looking at a severe anxiety attack, CBD oil is not going to dent that. But if I'm looking at low level levels of, of anxiety and depression, there is absolutely a benefit. But there is nothing that comes out of it that is even close to a high. Yeah. It is the equivalent of drinking a non-alcoholic beer and trying to get drunk, (laughs) you are not going to get there. You are going to have to, you are going to have to go and drink a vat of non-alcoholic beer to get the right levels of alcohol into your system to feel any effects. And it's the same here with CBD. So when we're talking about courts making decisions about whether somebody can harvest their field of hemp, it really does speak of attitudes from a very different era not being questioned and being allowed to just stand as accepted fact. And we're literally talking about decades worth of ignorance, largely. This legislation, the rules that were put in place around hemp and then not questioned for decades means that people have to go to great lengths to re-educate the public about the the safety of the material. Yeah, that's the biggest downside of this. It's it's set back development of this material decades. So even though I highlighted in the video, oh, here's these two great companies that are doing these hemp block style things. And here's an example of a house being built with it. And here's all the benefits. It's not perfect, but it solves a lot of different problems. It is still not, it's not approved for, as a building material in every location. So it's like you, you're going to have to check it with your local authorities because it still hasn't gone through all the rigorous testing for getting certifications for making sure that it meets certain building codes and all that kind of stuff. So your region may not have approved it as an official thing so that if, you know, you're trying to get a building permit, they may say, no, you can't do that because they have no experience with it. It's because it's set back decades because of the stupidity from the, you know, the 19th century, you know, 20th century. So it's, it's going to take a while for things to kind of catch up. And I'm hoping that they do. And I remember going back 20 years into college, there were plenty of stores. I remember like little record stores that right next door would be like a little hemp shop that would have hemp right. clothing, hemp rugs. And of course they would have drug paraphernalia in there as well. Right. Not that I shop for that, but they had plenty of I would other- hope you wouldn't considering <laughs> yeah. you were not a, yet in a, even a double digit age, but I know, uh, yeah. But but regardless, it was I, I just have memories of those shops existing for a long time, but it was such a niche crowd. And it's yeah. like fast forward 20, 30 years, and we're still not that far off from that period. And it seems a shame because there's so much potential here. Yeah, it was a very niche interest and it was very closely associated here in the US with the hippie movement. Drugs. And it was yes. and it was it was laughed at. It was used as a punchline of like, mm-hmm. Hey man, how about some hemp, you know, you hemp fibers and we'll make some shoes. And it was just like, that's <laughs> not what we're talking about. It's the impact here is huge. And one of the things I wanted to talk about in detail 
around the building materials that you've introduced us to in your video mm -hmm. are questions around the accompanying materials that go with the hemp blocks and ways to either incorporate in an all in or a partial fashion. And what I mean is you talked about hemp on its own does not have the ability to become a load bearing wall. Correct. So the homes that you talked about in the video were all being framed first. So you had wooden mm -hmm. frames that were going up and there was in the, the shot showing the Lego block style hemp bricks where they've got holes in the center and the framing actually goes through those holes, helping to interconnect them and give them the rigidity that they need. That they need. And I'm wondering about the two steps forward, one step back of hemp, very renewable, can be grown very quickly. We can make building materials out of it, but you're also going to need to use wood. So I'm wondering about options other than wood. Did you see anything where people were talking about other renewable options like perhaps bamboo or no? is there another option that might come out of a style of either a 3D printing technique potentially around the hemp itself? Is there any way to get the hemp itself to be strong enough to become a load bearing material? Mm -hmm. Not from anything that we found on the research. It really came down to steel, concrete columns, or wood framing as the supporting material. And while that sounds like, oh, that, that stinks, it's, you can't be a completely hemp, so why bother? Well, if you cut back 90% of the concrete you need to build a home, that seems like a win. Right. So it's like you're not doing concrete walls and concrete floors. You're doing a handful of columns or steel columns or wood columns. It doesn't really matter. And as far as renewable materials, wood is a renewable material. So it's like, there's not a downside to using wood. It, it's car, it's you're <laughs> just like hemp. You're capturing the carbon. You're using it as a building material. It's going to be locked away in the house, just like the hemp will be. The difference is it takes, you know, decades to grow a tree where it takes weeks to grow hemp. <laughs> so right. obviously hemp has the edge there, but as far as renewable, renewability, there's no way, there is no way that you can have a truly net zero carbon free you know build and not have an impact in the environment way there's no way you can do it it's not possible so mm -hmm. the idea that we have to be able to achieve a perfect greenhouse that's you're going to be chasing that forever because you'll never do it right it's all about how can you reduce the impact how can you make it better and be smarter about your building material choices and how you build so right. for this it's like it's an improvement it doesn't have to be perfect it's just an improvement right Sounds like you're saying, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Exactly. Yes. So if you were looking at a mixing and matching style of building a home using this, would you argue that, okay, a majority hemp with the underlying structure being concrete, steel, or wood is the mm -hmm. way to go? Or is a mixing and matching approach of a majority of the building is built using what we'll call traditional building techniques? And then maybe one wall or one section being built out of hemp. Do you think that that would be, somebody would look at that and say, that's the way I want to go? Or do you think that's the sort of thing that like, why would you bother doing that? I was going to say, you're talking to the guy who's Mr. Pragmatic. I'm, I'm a, in the mindset of do what's right for your specific situation. So if that meant one wall is hemp, then do one wall is hemp. It's like, just do whatever is right for your specific build out. I don't think there's going to be a prescription that's like, it's not worth it if you, if you only can do it this much. It's like, mm -hmm. it comes down to what is your end goal? What's your goal for the project? And what, what kind of costs are you looking at? And then just factor in and wiggle around in that space to figure out what the right solution is. So I, have, I, have, I have would say one wall is better than none right. <laughs> if, if, if that's right for you. Right. And what did you find as far as limitations to the size? Is this the kind of building material where you're saying, okay, a, a three or four bedroom house might be about as large as you can go with this, or is it really just about the underlying structure, whatever underlying structure you can get to give it the resilience it needs, you can go as large as you need to. There are limitations. It, de it depends on the project and the, the material, but like I was finding on some of these hemp block companies had statements of like, you can build a wall up to, you know, 12 feet high. 
and you know this wide for a single wall or you know they gave, they gave dimensions and sizes for what that was the recommended max that you'd want to go they were sizable so it's like if you're talking about like a single family home yeah you're going to be just fine if you're trying to build like foundation walls and stuff like that you could do that with hemp blocks no problem but you're not going to be building a you know 10 story apartment building with hemp right <laughs> that's not going to happen right so there are limitations but like like you brought up earlier hemp has so many uses when we were doing the research for this it was kind of like going down a rabbit hole of like oh well you could use hemp for this and you can use hemp for that hemp use over here it's insulation it's it's hempcrete it's you know yeah. ropes it's fibers it's rugs it's all these different materials that you can make out of it and we just zeroed in on just one use of it so there's so many different other videos and paths we could go down that it, it's kind of insane the number of videos we could make <laughs> right. all the different uses of hemp yeah, to return to Frederick Larson's comment, I wanted to sh share some of his thoughts about growing hemp, which included these. One decisive advantage that was not mentioned here, it's the way that the plant dominates. Anything growing under it will die. Two years with hemp, and it looks like the ground has been sprayed with weed killer. It's an absolutely fantastic weed killer, if the joke doesn't hide the serious truth here. I have no <laughs> doubts about hemp being a vital part in the future of agricultural economies not least because it works great on rather bad farmland, but also because it restores land without pesticides. On top of that, well, it's not what this video is about, and I agree completely about what is said. It is a game changer the day we have adjusted the building routines to the finished products. I think that that's it's a very interesting take from Frederick, and thank you for sharing those comments. And a reminder yeah. to our other listeners, if you have any comments about this, if you have any firsthand experience, jump into the comments. You can reach out to us through the contact information in the podcast description or on YouTube. You can just scroll below the video and leave a comment there. There was also this from Tom Dalton, and he touches on something that you just mentioned, Matt. Matt, in addition to the newer products, hemp provided great products in the past, as you pointed out. We'd like to mention that using hemp for paper and in place of cotton would drastically help the environmental impact regarding carbon capture. I think that that's, I keep coming back to that as the big exclamation mark from your video of mm -hmm. growing this is the advantages for carbon capture just can't be ignored. Yep. Yeah. Carbon, carbon is what is needed to grow trees, plants, everything. So it's like the more we can take, lean into that, uh, bamboo came up a bunch in the comments and you brought it up too. It's the same thing. It's like <laughs> hemp is kind of a weed. Mm -hmm. Bamboo is kind of a weed. It's a grass. And these things grow so fast. So you can like grow them almost as fast as you need to chop them down. And it creates a really good cycle of growth and kind of like cut down and rebirth and just kind of going through the whole cycle over and over again. It's, it's really interesting. I also wanted to share this comment from Aiden Wozness, who I think puts a nice cap on the entire discussion. As an industry insider, this is great to see. Hemp does indeed have a lot of potential. The issue right now is setting up the infrastructure because it's challenging, if at all possible, to convert equipment for other crops to be used for hemp, except for very simple agricultural tools. We can have the vision of planting thousands of acres and building millions of homes and could even have the manpower and money for it, but we still require the infrastructure. Otherwise, mm. we'll be importing this material too, and that is almost worse than the concrete supply chain. Thank you for taking the idea a bit more mainstream. I was wondering, in your research, did you see any of the discussion about infrastructure development that Aiden yeah. was sharing with us there? What kinds of steps do you th see needing to be taken before this can become a viable from production to consumption chain that we would hope to see? It's every facet of the supply chain. It's, it's no different than any other product. It's, you have to build up not just the, the farmers that are creating this stuff, but you have to address the legality, the logistics of like, not the logistics, but the legality around like policies in the local regions to make sure that it's legal and above board and approved for how it's getting used. You have to have the proper equipment, the proper, you know, companies that are doing the disbursement and the handling of all the materials. It's, it's basically non-existent. It's, it, it does sort of exist, but it's such at its infancy that it only really works in pockets, right? It, it's not nationwide by any stretch. So it's, there's a lot of building to do. This is something that's going to take 
decades yeah. to build out unless there's serious investment. That's that's the downside. All right. This is not the same as the reintroduction to alcohol in the United States post prohibition because during that phase of prohibition, organized crime kept the alcohol supply yes. chain running. Very much. So once it was legalized, they just pulled the fake placards off the side of the ice cream truck and put the name of Seagram's back on it and then started delivering alcohol in the open. This is different. The production to <laughs> consumption was actually dismantled in a yeah. way that goes deeper. So and, it'll be and prohibition gave us NASCAR. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to no go joke. into that one. You're no, going to have to go into no that joke. one. I don't understand that reference. They would soup up their cars and their trucks to be able to outrun the cops. And then the, <laughs> they would have private races amongst themselves to see who had the fastest car. And it eventually morphed once prohibition stopped, it kept going and they kept doing it and it morphed into what we know now as NASCAR. So it's like, <laughs> which, which includes Budweiser as a sponsor. So exactly. We full circle, <laughs> full circle. <laughs> Welcome to reality. No. Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, please do consider reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is you pick up the podcast, including right here on YouTube. And if you'd like to directly support us, you can go to stilltbd.fm and there's a become a supporter button. You can click that and throw quarters at our heads, or you can just click join on YouTube and YouTube will let you throw quarters at our heads. In any event, our heads thank you. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time.